Um, good evening. Thank you all for joining us. Before we begin tonight's meeting, I'd like to welcome everyone to our virtual meeting, and I'd like to explain this meeting format. Tonight, we have our commissioners and staff visible on a video feed. Members of the public have been invited to comment on Weaver Speaks in advance of tonight's meeting and are also able to participate live through web link or by calling in on the phone. You can find that information on your meeting agenda at www.weaverspeaks.org. All members of the public who are participating live have been muted. When it is time for public comment at the start of the meeting or as part of the public hearing, we will unmute all members of the public and I will ask you to speak in order based on the first letter of your last name. When we unmute the public, please keep background noise to minimum. You may choose to mute yourself through your own device. If you do not plan to participate at all this evening, we recommend you simply view the meeting live by watching on channel eight or on WeWorkSpeaks.org. If you do plan to participate this evening, when you speak, please first state your name clearly, spell your last name and give your street address for the record. The time limit for public comment is three minutes per person. Speakers may not donate their time. When there are no more speakers, I will close the time for public comment and public participants will be muted again. We appreciate your patience with this virtual format. As with our in-person meetings, our hope is that we create a friendly and respectful atmosphere for public dialogue and we appreciate your help in this process. Thank you. I'd now like to call the City of Wheat Ridge Planning Commission for July 2nd, 2020 to order. Can I get roll call members, please? Ari Kritschiver. Oh, Here, you'll have to unmute. Here, sorry, I think I've done this enough times. <laughs> Jahi Simbai. I'm here. Scott Ohm. Here. Christine Disney. Here. Melissa Antle. Here. Janet Leo. Here. Daniel Larson. Here. And Will Kearns is absent tonight. Okay, the next item on the order of the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. We're going to wait for the flag to appear. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag to the flag of the United States, States of America, 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 the next item on the list is to approve the order of, of the agenda. And, and uh, before we continue with the agenda, I'd like to explain how we'll be voting on the items tonight. Once we have a motion and a second, all commissioners in support of the motion will be asked to raise their hands and to keep them raised and visible until the recording secretary acknowledged that they have recorded those votes. After voting, the recording secretary will read the result of the vote to confirm it is recorded correctly. We will use this protocol for any voting scenario tonight. Is there a motion to approve the order of the agenda? Um, the is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Call for vote. Motion passed seven to zero. And then the next item is the uh, approval of minutes. Um, so this will be for, is there a motion to approve the minutes from June 4? 2020. Mr. Chairman, I, I've moved that we approve the minutes from the uh, June 4th meeting. Second. I second it. Any discussion? And uh, I assume that our newest commissioner, Commissioner uh, Kircha Church of Beer, uh, will be abstaining. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Call, call for a vote. In favor, right? Yes. Yes. Motion passed six to zero with one abstaining. Okay. Um, I'll now open up the public forum. 
Um, we have two items on tonight's agenda, and these are items that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, this is the time for any person to speak on any subject not appearing on tonight's agenda. You'll have a maximum of three minutes to speak. Speakers may not donate their time. Are there, is there anyone signed up for the public forum? There is no one signed up. Okay, I will now close the public forum. And we will open up the... Um, uh, yes? Commissioner Ohm, do you mind yes. just going through the alphabet for us to make sure there's no one on the line? Uh, yeah, is there anybody with last names A through E? And I'll, I'm going to briefly reopen the public forum. Is there anyone with last names F through J? Is there anyone with last name K through O? Is there anyone with last names P through T? Is there any with the last names U through Z? Are there any others that are in the queue or signed up? No hands raised. Okay. I will now close the public forum. We will move into public hearings. We have two public hearings tonight. For the public hearing, we'll, we will be adding appropriate staff and when applicable, the applicants to our video feed. Their screens will be shared if presentations are being made. They will remain a part of the video feed until conclusion of the respective agenda items. After the presentations, the commission will ask uh, and question uh, questions of staff and the applicant. And then we will conduct a public comment portion of the hearing. This will be conducted in the same manner as earlier by unmuting our public participants. We typically administer an oath for any participant in a public hearing, staff, applicants, and the public in this virtual meeting format. We're administering that oath in a different way. If you comment during a public hearing tonight by choosing to testify, you're agreeing that the testimony you give will be the truth as you know it. I will now open up public hearing case number WZ-19-06, an application filed by Foothills Credit Union for approval of a specific development plan for a 15,000 square foot office building and ask for the staff report. Hello, commissioners and members of the public. Um, Scott Cutler, uh, planning um, in the planning division at the city of Wheat Ridge. Um, I will be playing two videos tonight. Uh, first, my staff presentation, and then the applicant's staff presentation. Do wanna make everyone aware that we have um, several members of the applicant team on the call tonight. Um, and so after I play their video, um, they may either introduce themselves individually or um, you can also ask questions of that applicant team. Uh, those members are Drew Gregory of Punch Architecture, Scott McNeil, who's the president of Foothills Credit Union, Eric Stream with Kiowa Civil Engineering, and Christine McWright, uh, who's the master developer of Clear Creek Crossing. Um, so with that, I will share my screen and start my video. Hello, my name is Scott Cutler, and I'm a planner with the City of Wheat Ridge Community Development Department. I'm presenting case number WZ-1906, which is approval of a specific development plan in Clear Creek Crossing at 3550 Clear Creek Drive. I would like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning regulations, and this digital presentation. The properties within the City of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met. 
and therefore the Planning Commission has jurisdiction to hear this case. So noted. This is a 2018 aerial of the property. The property is outlined in red. It's approximately one and a half acres and is currently vacant. It's located on the east side of Clear Creek Drive, north of the new I-70 hook ramps and west of Interstate 70. It's the second commercial parcel of Clear Creek Crossing to develop and is part of planning area four north, the Vineyard Commercial District. This is an updated view from June 2020 um, showing how the site's construction has progressed. Foothills Credit Union site is shown in the blue star. This is a zoning map of the site. The site is zoned planned mixed use development. Some surrounding areas, including the 70 West Business Center to the south and Appwood Village Shopping Center to the east, are zoned planned commercial development. The applicant is requesting to build an approximately 15,000 square foot, three-story office and bank building. I'll show all of this on the next slide. There will be a landscaping buffer on four sides, two vehicular entrances off of an access road, pedestrian connections to the west and north, a courtyard at the entrance with bike parking, a rooftop patio, and a bank drive through with three lanes for customers. The SDP consists of 13 pages, including a site plan shown here, landscape plan, building elevations, photometric, lighting details, and site furnishing details. This site plan is annotated to show the locations of the building and streets on all sides of the development. The parking and drive areas surround the building with a main parking area on the west side of the building between it and Clear Creek Drive. Separate parcel called Tract A is located to the south and will be owned and maintained by the Longs Peak Metro District. The site has pedestrian access to Clear Creek Drive and across the access road to the future development on the north. The drive through is located on the south side of the building. This is the landscape plan for the site. A wide landscaping buffer is located between the street and the parking lot. Due to a large Denver water easement, trees cannot be planted along the frontage on Clear Creek Drive. The site does have trees along the north and east sides and in the courtyard. The project exceeds the minimum 20% landscaping coverage for this planning area. The site does not include the I-70 embankment to the east, which will be maintained by Longs Peak Metro District, which is responsible for the overall Clear Creek Crossing development. It also does not include Tract A to the south, which will be reviewed by the Planning Division separately. These are some of the color renderings of the building. Standard elevations are included in the SDP packet as an exhibit in the staff report. The style is driven by Clear Creek Crossing Design Pattern Book and the Vision Book. It is meant to have a modern agrarian aesthetic, blending modern styles with a traditional agrarian feel. The use of rusted metal panels, tan colored CMU block, and brick around the first floor accomplishes these goals. Windows along the first floor, especially on the west side facing Clear Creek Drive, allow for transparency and invite users of the space into the courtyard at the main entrance. The project includes a second floor patio. It also incorporates wood elements next to windows. The tan CMU wall will also act as a rooftop mechanical screen. City of Council approved the rezoning of Clear Creek Crossing in 2018 with an outline development plan and design pattern book to accompany it. This SDP is based on the standards approved under the ODP. Since Wheat Ridge is not a full service city, we sent the application on referral to outside agencies, as well as completed an internal review. Engineering and planning have both found the SDP to be approvable. Outside agencies, including the fire department, have no remaining comments, and the applicant is responsible for coordinating utility service with those districts. Civil construction documents have also been approved by engineering. If approved, the applicant would be required to submit for a building permit prior to construction. Before the hearing, the property was posted for 15 days and letters were sent to all property owners within a 300 foot radius. This presentation is also available for viewing on the Wheat Ridge Speaks website. Ultimately, staff has concluded the request is in compliance with the approved ODP, consistent with the design pattern book, consistent with the purposes of a planned development, and all agencies can serve the property. It will allow the development of the site as presented this evening to proceed. The Planning Commission is compelled to review the application against the SDP criteria for review. 
The intent of Planning Commission's review is to allow a publicly appointed body and the public at large to verify staff's conclusion that the project meets the intent and standards of the underlying zoning. For all of those reasons, staff recommends approval of the request. Recommended conditions of approval are provided in the staff report. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And now I will share uh, the applicant's video. Give me just a minute. All right. Hi there. My name is Drew Gregory. I'm a partner with Punch Architecture located at 6021 East 50th Avenue, Commerce City, Colorado, 80022. And I have the privilege of walking you through the Foothills Credit Union at Clear Creek Crossing. Foothills Credit Union has been serving the local community in Colorado since 1946. Below are just a few of its core values. Foothills Credit Union has many strong visions. One of them being educating individuals, empowering families, and enriching communities with exciting financial solutions. Their mission, to provide Foothills Credit Union members with quality financial services. Below you can see a few of those services, as well as their current locations in Lakewood, Loveland, and soon to be Wheat Ridge. Foothills Credit Union is a big supporter of the local communities that they serve. A lot of this support includes getting involved with and sponsoring local community events. Below you can see some of the various community events they've done in the Lakewood area, as well as the Loveland area. A great quote from Scott McNeil, president of Foothills Credit Union. Every year we look forward to the many sponsorship opportunities the cities of Lakewood and Loveland provide for us to participate in the community. All the events and programs we support are great examples of our desire to give back to these communities. Foothills Credit Union is all about community and service and being an active participant in improving the financial well-being of those we serve. The design for Foothills Credit Union is a modern agrarian design aesthetic. I think we're really excited when we first were introduced to the Clear Creek pattern book is just how site specific um, and how well documented it had with case studies in agriculture and how well it was uh, put into the landscape. Uh, Foothills Credit Union really tries to pick up off the nature in the distant vistas of the Rocky Mountains. So it was our goal is to use natural materials, the core tin steel, a really cool play of paneling that shifts the stratification, just like the Red Rock Mountains. Uh, the window has a very playful approach of shifting, almost like you'd see the forest. Um, the mass, um, even being three stories is set down low into uh, the berm behind the hook ramp, uh, just kind of a peekaboo uh, with, again, the majority of the view looking west back towards those uh, great vistas. As previously stated, Foothills Credit Union is in the northern portion of PA4. It is a part of the Vineyard Commercial District in the planned mixed use development. The Foothills Credit Union is the primary building function with accessory office space in the upper floors. Our main goal for the site integration was to make it as easy and safe for vehicular, bicycle, and pedestrian circulation. We brought a lot of attention to connecting to these existing areas with dedicated paths throughout the site. From the west property line at Clear Creek Drive, we dedicated a direct access through our site to the main entrance. This is enhanced with landscape, crosswalks, and lighting that leads members and pedestrians to our entry courtyard and to the front door. From the North PA3 district, we also have a dedicated path and crosswalks that lead to the entry courtyard. Also, our main vehicular entry is aligned with the entry to PA3. The site has 60 parking stalls and 10 dedicated bike spots. The drive up to the south of the building is three lanes to serve the Foothills members. This drive up was orientated to the south of our site so it would be as non-visible as possible. This was achieved due to the height of the sloping hook ramps as well as the adjacent retaining walls to the southeast. The design for Foothills Credit Union is a modern agrarian style. 
The building footprint was pushed back as far as possible to the east portion of the site and closest to the I-70 corridor. Here, the three-story scale mirrors the intensity of the nearby traffic, while the west massing and form creates a pedestrian-human scale, with the first floor credit union shifting from the mass to create a one-story element at the main entrance of the building. This first floor was also enhanced with a roof deck above to activate the west facade and entry courtyard. The design utilizes compatible materials with the Argarian's design aesthetic. With the use of Corten steel, brick, and wood accents, we were able to achieve materials that convey a sense of quality. As you will see in the next slides, these also create a rich variety of materials, colors, and textures. This is a perspective of the west facade, which most members and pedestrians will see coming down Clear Creek Drive. Here you can see how the first floor projects from the three-story element that helps create that human scale. To the right of the perspective, you can see the three drive-up lanes tucked in below the berm and retaining walls of the hook ramp. This is a perspective of the north courtyard entry. Uh, here you can kind of see how all those materials start to work together. The beautiful rich red core tin that will be seen in the adjacent hills and mountains. Um, the lattice work and openings that allows transparency into the courtyard all the way into the credit union. Um, a lot of attention has been brought into the landscape and how we soften those sidewalks and corridors and how you bring the members into the space. This is a perspective of the Northwest main entrance. Here you can start to see how the forms articulate in the mass was set back. Uh, the one story element with the roof deck above that will activate that courtyard. Lush landscape in that entry courtyard uh, with a large shade tree that will shade the seating area as well as the bicycle parking. This is a perspective of the southwest corner of the project. Here you can kind of see the three lane drive up and how the berming behind it really hides and conceals that area. Again, the brick base, the core tin above, and the wood accents. This is a perspective of the northeast corner. Here you can kind of see how the three-story element responds to I-70 and the intense traffic. The vertical tower in the center of the building extends up above the parapet and will also screen our mechanical. This is also a good example of the strong block and brick base with the core tin floating above. This is a perspective of the roof deck on the second floor above the credit union. Uh, just shows what amazing views we have to the west. Um, when this space is used by the Foothills Credit Union, it'll activate that entry courtyard and really be seen from Clear Creek Drive. This concludes our presentation. We want to thank you for reviewing. I want to say we're incredibly excited for the Foothills Credit Union to be in Wheat Ridge and serve and help the community. We look to break ground in fall 2020. Thank you again. Thank you. That concludes all of the presentations. Uh, and as a reminder, there are several members of the applicant team on the call. Thank you. We will now have the, see if the commissioners have any questions for staff or the applicant. I will start um, with Commissioner Critchipper. Do you have any questions for the staff or applicant? I do not at this time, thank you. Commissioner Simbai, do you have any questions? I do have a couple, probably for you, Scott. Um, just more on the question of square footage. I'm, it says it's a whole lot. I'm, I'm referring to page 20 <coughs> of the report. Said the total square footage is 65,000 square feet, and the total lot coverage is 46, close to 47 square thousand square feet. I was just wondering about that additional 20,000 square foot. It only happened not clear. I'm a planner with the city of Weaver's community development. Visiting case number is oh, Sorry, I'm getting, can you hear me? This is Scott. Specific development plan. Oh, someone's 
it sounds like it's playing my video, actually. Wow. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. The public record, the contents of the case file, the zoning regulations, and this digital presentation. We'll just, just stand by for a little bit. Do you want us to? Okay, I think it was on Commissioner Larson. It sounded like it was the video is coming from your computer. <laughs> don't know. Okay, continue. All right, okay. well, yeah, I can, I can um, answer that question as far as the area goes, unless you had another one. I have um, a couple more, um, but. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the other one was related to the, the bike stalls. The, um, it sounded like the applicant report said there was 10, and then, then the, uh, the document, it says there's nine. And I was just, I was confused by the note down at the bottom, which is a, a, a four additional parking, uh, four additional bicycle, bicycle parking spaces have been provided within the site development. The offset the shortage of two vehicular parking spaces per code. Parking may be reduced by one stall for two extra bicycle parking spaces for up to 10%. So it sounds like I read it right that there was three bikes, bicycle stalls required, but they were provided, but they provided nine. So I'm just a little bit confused. Like it seems like uh, there was actually six additional ones instead of four. Um, it's minor, but just had a question about that too. Sure. Yeah. So I, I think um, our code does allow um, if sites are short on parking to supplement um, some bicycle parking. And typically a U rack is considered to be two spaces. So I think 10 is actually the correct number. If there were five U racks installed, two bicycles could park on each one. Um, so perhaps that note is incorrect, um, but whatever is shown on the site plan is is what's being provided. And I'm trying to find that page, but I'm, I'm struggling a little bit right now. Yeah, it's, it's under the site data on well, what's on my page 20. Um, it's a couple of things under the parking data that caught my eye. But it, that's enough for now for, for me. Okay. Okay, uh, Commissioner Disney. Uh, just a question for clarification. Um, you mentioned in the presentation that there were 60 parking spaces and I was only able to count 58. And from what I understand, two could be removed because of the bicycle accommodations. Is that correct for my clarification? That is correct, yes. Okay. So, yeah, I believe um, it does say required parking is 60 and they're providing 58 on the site. So okay. that, yes, that's correct. Any other questions, Commissioner Disney? No, I'm I'm good. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Larson. Uh, yeah, just one real quick question. Um, I, I see that the Denver water easement comes kind of diagonally through the property. Uh, it looks like on the southwest corner. Uh, where are the rest? Where's the rest of the utility easement? Uh, where does it uh, come into the property at? I can start and then um, if someone wants to chime in from the applicant team, um, there is most of the utilities are located kind of in that loop um, around the access road on the north side. Um, and then um, Excel has some easements around the perimeter of the property, but primarily the utilities are coming in from Clear Creek Drive and they have their own easements. There is a plat under review by the city right now um, and the plat is an administrative process, but it's gonna be dedicating a significant amount of utility easements, uh, including sanitation and water um, beyond just the standard Denver water. Um, and that's under review right now. I believe it's approvable at this point. Great, thank you. Commissioner Antle. Not, not at this time. Maybe in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Leo. Nothing. 
Okay, uh, I think that's all the commissioners. I have some questions. Um, let's start on the first one, page uh, sheet four, I think. I noticed that the, um, uh, and maybe you went over this, there's why, I guess my question is, is why is the proposed grading for the Foothills Credit Union occurring um, in Tract A? Typically, the grading is usually um, on site per, per project. I think given the nature of, of the site and how it there's retaining walls that are holding up some dirt outside of the property lines that there is going to have to be some cross grading between the various properties. So between this site and, and tract A, just to allow um, the, that work to be done. And the intent um, behind this would be that all of that work is occurring at the same time. So it's not just done in isolation on each property. So, um, so that's likely why it is shown off site just a bit. Um, and it also is showing that there is a significant amount of grading that's being done to allow for that drive through to be sunken uh, where it is. So does the applicant own track day or is that owned by the Clear Creek Crossing development? That would be uh, owned and maintained by Longs Peak Metro District. And so they, they have some type of, uh, I guess, some type of agreement that they can grade onto that property. Uh, Christine, do you want to jump in? I'm not sure. Sure, I'd be happy to jump in. Christine McWright with Evergreen Development. Um, so the way it will work is that Evergreen uh, with contracts with Long Peak Metro will improve Track Day and um, and then we will convey Track Day to Long Peak Metro to to maintain going forward. Okay. So there's some there's some type of agreement, correct? Absolutely. There's a myriad of agreements. Thank you for that. Okay. Sure. Sure thing. Uh, um, so the next, I have a I have a lot of questions now on sheet five, um, and these are specific questions. Um, so let's take a look at the landscape notes. Uh, landscape note number twelve states that all shrub beds are to be mulched with a minimum three inch depth shredded cedar mulch. Um, however, under the material legend, it says that 10,000 square feet is gravel and planted areas and only 3,000 to 235 square foot is bark mulch, which I assume is not really bark, but it's shred mulch. Um, I'm just kind of a little confused by that, by that note. There's kind of two things going on. Is that something that will get corrected prior to uh, building permit? I believe the intent is to actually follow the landscape plan as drawn um, on the, the plan. And if the note is an error, then that's something we can okay. look it's, at as a time of permit. Because it says all shrub beds is what it's dictated. There seems to be a conflict. Yeah, I think I think in cases like this, um, we would often defer to the actual plan as drawn um, because when an inspector goes out to the site, um, at least that's what they would be looking for. Um, I don't okay. know if the applicant team has a different answer, but that's what I would be doing if I was out on the site. Um, and then the next one is the note number thirteen. It just it doesn't it says uh, it talks about gravel mulch, but it doesn't state what the type and size of gravel mulch. Um, so I just have a question like what, what is that gravel mulch? We have a city standard for gravel mulch, um, and it's not shown in the plan and I don't have that code section in front of me. Um, but it would, it would be required to meet city code. If it's not shown on the plan, it would have to meet city code. Okay. And then on, uh, landscape note number 24, it states that, um, rock mulch may be used. Well, where perennials are used, it says, um, but, uh, but anyway, it, uh, it, it talks about, um, it talks about where the rock mulch is used, then you have to have the, um, the fabric. It says, because that's what number 13 says. And so um, I guess my question is, isn't it tough for perennials to grow through rock placed over a weed barrier? Um, that doesn't seem very typical. I would need to defer to their landscaper and landscape architect on that one. 
Okay. We hear from the landscape architect on that one. Hey there, sorry, I was on mute. This is Drew Gregory from Punch Architecture. Um, apologize is that my landscape architect is not on this meeting. Um, so I would have to defer to them, but it does sound like there's just some missed notes and I could get some clarification on that just to clarify that before this would be finalized. Okay. Um, and, and commissioner, um, we would always defer to best practice. So, if, you know, if there's a note that's in conflict with something that would keep a plan from surviving, then we're not going to go out there and tell them to put down the weed barrier if it's going to result in plants dying. So we're not okay. generally looking that specifically. Um, and then let's move on. Uh, I know the, the caliper size for, uh, so one of the, one of the things is along, um, what is the road that runs west? Clear Creek Drive. So on Clear Creek Drive, the applicant was supposed to have by code three street trees, correct? Yes. But the, but there is an existing encumbrance of the 100 foot Denver water easement. Um, and so the applicant has worked out with staff that those street trees are going to be placed on the, the private access road, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then the caliper inches shown for those deciduous trees, which is two inch, which is not typical for street trees because the design pattern book doesn't say two and a half inch, it, it says two inch, correct? Yeah, the design pattern book um, has a, a lower standard than city code for that particular okay. requirement. Okay. Um, and then uh, there's a tree shown right at that entry of the access road. Um, I don't know if you can put that up or not, that landscape plan. Um, but it, can that tree be in the existing 50 foot CMWC easement? I don't, I don't even know what the CMWC, what is that for? That's the Consolidated Mutual Water Company. Okay. Um, they have reviewed the plan, um, including the landscape plan. They've gotten several full referrals um, yes. and have had no objections. So it is on the very edge of that easement. And I think perhaps that's why I think if it was in the middle, they probably would feel differently, but it's pretty far and away. And that easement's or that actual line is right in the middle of that 50 foot easement. So it, it likely would not interfere, can but you, we haven't heard you, anything from them. Yeah. Can you, uh, Mr. Cutler, can you please pull up the landscape plan sheet five? So sure. Yeah, I'm trying to do that right now. Okay. Okay. And this um, is, I'm circling what I believe yes. you're talking about. Yeah. Yes, that one right there, it's uh, it's in that that easement right there, but it's near the edge. Um, and then, but the there's an ornamental tree right where your hand is right now. That one right there. Yes. Oh, here, yes. <laughs> um, it's, I don't know if the, if everybody can see that, but there's a proposed sewer line that it, it, I'm guessing is probably about three feet away from that ornam ornamental tree. What is, is there any, uh, what is the horizontal separation from a sewer pipe to tree? I'm not sure. I don't know if someone else could chime in. Yeah. And I, I, actually, I guess is yeah, three to, again, that we would locate that approximately three to five feet away. Okay. Um, and then uh, has Denver water have they reviewed and approved the landscape plans and had they, did they have any criteria of any uh, depth of roots of any plants that were prohibited or anything? Had they reviewed this? I'll start and then probably turn over to the applicant. Um, Denver water did receive a referral in this application. Um, they've been working closely with Evergreen on a lot of site uh, design and landscaping um, and have pretty strict requirements about that. I have not seen any comments from them um, objecting to anything as proposed on this plan, um, but I don't know if they've commented specifically on species or root depth or anything like that. Um, Christine or others, I don't know if you've heard anything 
uh, more specific from Denver Water, but the referral we sent them, they had no objections. Uh, I could just add on to that is uh, probably on round one and round two of the comments is uh, we had had trees located in that easement at one point and that we had direct comments back for them that there was um, not to be any trees, you know, within that easement as well as any lighting elements um, and that all they really felt comfortable was with uh, shrubs. So I get to say is that, yes, we took all those trees out. And as long as we were outside that 100 foot easement, they were okay with it. And to that point, just building off that consolidated at one point, we had trees on their easement. Um, we've removed those trees as well. Um, but they never did specifically comment on roof depth. Okay. Because the it looks like there's a group of three um, that I'm seeing. And those shrubs are, uh, I would actually probably consider them to be almost like a small ornamental tree, the Saskatoon service berries. Um, but that's just a, that was just a question I had. Um, most plans, most plans that I see typically don't just have symbols. They have like a little call out what they are. Um, but that's what it appears to me is that those are the Saskatoon service berries. And then unfortunately there's no, on the landscape legend, there's, it doesn't, it doesn't say what the, um, the height width would be mature width. And so um i guess that's that'd be my question if that, that i've seen the service berries use or now trees if that is okay by denver water um let's move on it is, uh, since we don't have a landscape architect here we won't be able to answer that question let's move on to some other questions on the the east side there's um uh looks like proposed five foot easements on the far east side of the property line um can can trees, it looks like there's uh, some proposed, uh, what are those, uh, Austrian pines. Um, can those Austrian pines be planted in that five foot Excel easement? Um, Excel has also reviewed the plan and has not objected to anything. Um, that is also likely a requested perimeter easement that doesn't actually have any utility service in it. Um, I know there are parking lot lights out there, um, but often they'll request perimeter easements. Same goes for residential properties and then the property owner will plant stuff in it. It's more for okay. access than anything, um, yeah. but they haven't, they haven't objected to anything. I'd, Okay. Pretty sure they approved it on the first go. Okay. And then on the the southwest, I was kind of looking through the landscape legend. It looks like on that south cor southeast corner, there's like two evergreens and there's a deciduous in between. Uh, those Austrians, the the symbols are shown fairly small. They look like they're about the size of a parking space, about ten feet wide. They they grow to about thirty feet wide. But anyway, um, it looks like there's a birch tree that's planted uh which needs a lot of water so it's a heavy water user but it's planted next to the the austrian pine and the manzanita shrub which are low water use so i'm kind of curious why kind of the high use water birch tree was chosen in between the low water use plants it's like two different hydrozones um that's just a question i have and, and, and maybe we can just i guess put it put a pin in that one for the, the landscape architect. Um, but one one comment I, I want to go over real quick was um, the part of the section 26, and, and it's an intended purpose of the zoning code, is it says in general is to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens and residents of the city of Wheat Ridge. Um, on the east side of the building, there are two, um, looks like they're, I think they're limbercone or bristle pines, um, bristlecone pine, that they're planted, they're, they're drawn very small, they get about 15 feet wide, they look like they're probably drawn a little less than 10 foot wide, but they're planted on the, the south side on the pedestrian sidewalks, um, uh, and they, there's the, the, the does the applicant have any, I guess they can provide shading problems in the wintertime and icing. Um, 
And then I, I know the applicant talked about trying to make this a safe, you know, kind of safe site for the pedestrians, but uh, we have this vehicle traffic that's coming around, around there and evergreens are gonna block a lot of visual access um, as someone is exiting the bank building just in normal times. Um, and then during the winter time, these evergreens are gonna shade, provide a lot of shading and create kind of icy areas as well. Why? Why were the evergreens considered for these areas? The evergreen trees. This is on the um, southeast side. Uh, the east side of the of the building. Um, there's two two larger symbols. They're just south of the sidewalk. So uh, yes, one right there, and then one right there. Yep, those are the the two pine trees, those pine trees would be about 15 feet wide, you know, probably 25, 30 feet tall. Um, I'm just curious why, why you would plant the evergreen tree in the south side of the sidewalk. And, and also because you have your vehicle access, cars coming by and that will create kind of a visibility issue as that as a pine tree is screening that area, why those were chosen. Um, I mean, I could just say just based off the limited width, you know, we were looking for a tree that wasn't going to um, get too close to the building to your point of the 15 foot. And we're probably showing about 10 um, that we were just trying to reduce um, the width of that tree. Um, I, you know, we are going to get the east morning sun. Um, you know, the building itself is going to shade that quite dramatically being what the height of it is already um, as that passes through. Once, you know, you get past the south face, the building itself shades that area quite significantly um but we could also yeah i mean at this point i could just say we could revisit that and look at that comment okay um i now want to move on to let's see here sheet uh, let me quickly take a look at sheet seven Let's, let's skip that, sheet seven. Sorry, where are we going? Um, where's, what sheet is it that has the, the building elevations? This one. Yeah. Sheet eight, is that sheet eight? Yes. Okay. Um, and I know that, uh, so there, I know that the, in the staff report, I mentioned that the building max height is set at 50 feet. Um, I didn't go above 50 feet. I, you broke up at the first part of that sentence. Sorry. Uh, so I understand that the building maximum height, I think, was stated at 50 feet, and that was per the the Clear Creek development uh, design pattern book. Um, can that signage, um, and I know it, it says right here, it says depicted for illustrative purposes. Um, can that signage go above uh, the, I guess, the building line, whatever that building line is? We would need to analyze that at the time of the sign permit, um, but it would have to be under the 50 foot maximum height. So okay. right now that parapet wall is at 46 feet um, yes. and the sign looks like it's probably more like 47 feet. I don't remember if our code requires it to be along the top line of the building or actually be carried above slightly if there are certain portions of the wall that project upwards. Uh, we wouldn't want it to be at the very top um, because then that kind of defeats the purpose of that utility screen, but we would need to look at that at the time of sign permit. Okay. And then uh, a little bit further down, um, let's see, go down a little bit to that second elevation. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so what is the what is the minimum height needed to screen the equipment from that from the top of the roof going up? What is that vertical distance? Um, I will defer to Drew on that one. And see it again, um, what is the minimum? We are pretty much 
um, our screen right now is probably right where um, our RTU will sit. So we're trying to keep that as, um, again, we're going through with engineers right now, setting those RTUs. Um, I mean, we've been working with Scott to try to integrate this uh, mechanical screening as much into the building as possible. Um, but I believe, let's see here. Um, but yeah, to the top of that roof parapet right now is at 154, and our goal is to not go over that, and that our RTU will sit uh, just below that. Okay, because that's the what I'm getting, what I'm trying to cut to the chase is that is the is the wall much much higher than what is necessary to screen? No, correct, it's not. Okay. We're we're right there, and I I would hate for us to be you know one inch above it. So we're we're trying to be right dead to it. So. That's okay. our goal. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm done with my questions. Do any of the other commissioners? Can you, uh, Mr. Color? Can you take down the um, that plan and so we can see the other um, commissioner screen? Um, do you want the next page of the elevations? No, I just want you to minimize minimize the PDFs. I have no further questions. I oh, just, okay, okay. There we go. Yeah. Sorry, I had to it's not shut okay. my door. <laughs> it's loud out in my hallway. Um, no, that's fine. Do any other commissioners have any other questions for the applicants or the uh, staff? If you if you have a question, please raise your hand. Commissioner Simbai. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, we kind of got off track, Scott, but I just had that question again about the 20,000 square feet that are, I don't know, uncovered um, between the total lot size and what's landscaped, et cetera, et cetera. Could you speak about, about that? Sure, and that was in the site data table, correct? Yeah, I believe that's under sheet seven on the bottom, kind of the, towards the bottom right, right side of the page. Um, sheet, I think it's sheet one. Okay. Yeah, there's the site data. So there's the built, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm referring to the correct thing. So there's the building footprint and then parking lot and drives, flat work and walkways. Is that the section you're referring to? I'm trying to uh, update. Um, the site data table that has site setbacks, landscaping data, total lot coverage, parking data. Um, are we speaking about the same thing? Yes. Okay. So under the landscaping data, it just says total lot size is 55 um, thousand square feet. And the total lot coverage is 46 at the bottom of that little table. Um, so I'm just curious about the sort of additional 20, just more, just to understand what that, what that means. Sure. So, um, the lot coverage as they're showing here is the building footprint plus the parking lot and drive paved area and then plus the flat work and walkways so that would add up to that 46,000 square feet and then the landscape area is the leftover which is about the 18,000 to 20,000 square feet so it's it's what is landscaped versus what is hard surfaced whether that's a building or parking or sidewalk um, it's pervious versus non-pervious surface technically. And, and the way the city of Wheat Ridge actually considers lot coverage is we only look at the building. Um, so in this case, it's, it's well under what we would allow um, in terms of the, the bulk of the building. I get it. Thank you. Any other no questions? Problem. For the staff or applicant for the commissioners okay i will now open up the hearing for public comment is there anyone that wishes to comment on this case you will have a maximum of three minutes to speak speakers may not donate their time when i recognize you please give us your name spell your last name and share your address we will unmute all participants. Please keep background noise to a minimum. If you do not plan to speak at this time, you may mute yourself through your own device. Is there anyone wishing to speak whose last name begins with A through E?
Is there anyone wishing to speak whose last name begins with F through J? Is there anyone wishing to speak whose last name begins with K through O? Is there anyone wishing to speak whose last name begins with P through T? Is there anyone whose last name begins with U through Z? Is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak? Please speak now before I close the citizens forum. Is there anyone in the queue? No hands raised, I think. We're good. Okay, I will now close the public forum. Uh, at this time, uh, I would entertain a motion. I'll move to approve case number WZ19-06. Want me to read the whole thing, Scott? Yes, yes, please. A request for approval of a specific development plan for the construction of a bank and office building on property located at 3550 Clear Creek Drive within planning area for Clear Creek Crossing for the following reasons. One, the specific development plan is consistent with the purpose of a plan development as stated in section 26-301 of the Code of Laws. Two, the specific development plan is consistent with the intent and purpose of the outlying development plan. Three, the proposed uses are consistent with those approved by the outlying development plan. Four, all responding agencies have indicated they can serve the property with improvements installed at the developer's expense. Five, the specific development plan is in substantial compliance with the applicable standards set forth in the outline development plan and with the city's adopted design manuals. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or comments from the commissioners? Um, I'm really excited about the, the project from the developer. Uh, it, uh, the architecture looks really nice. Um, I'm sure we'd all like to be on top of that little rooftop seeing the views. Um, as far as the, uh, the shading goes, I, I speak from experience that uh, I've, in my neighborhood, I have a, uh, I had a probably a 60 foot Colorado blue spruce that was on the Southwest corner that for years, uh, just continually shaded and the city would, would spend money to de-ice it. And it was just, it was just, uh, it wasn't good. And eventually the, the new owners, when they came, they ended up cutting the tree down. Um, and so that's, uh, that's why, you know, I definitely want to mention that to the the applicant. It's a it's a it's a safety concern, and um, but uh, it looks like a really nice nice project. Is there any other um, comments or discussion from the commissioners? Okay, seeing none, let's um, proceed with the motion. And this is in favor of the plan. I will call for a vote. Motion passed seven to zero. Thank you, everybody. We will now move on to our next case. Just a second here to Just a second here, bear with me. Okay, I'd like to open up, let's see here, K-1-1-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0
case number ZOA-20-03 in Orange, amending Chapter 26 of the Reverse Code of Laws pertaining to the form and timing of cash and move payment for parkland dedication requirements. Uh, and we, uh, what I'd like to uh, administer an oath for any participants in a public hearing, staff, applicants in the public in this virtual meeting format, we are administering that oath in a different way. If you comment during a public hearing tonight by choosing to testify, you're agreeing that testimony you give will be the truth as you know it. You may I have the staff report? Good evening, planning commissioners. Thanks for being patient with me tonight. I'll go ahead and share my screen of the presentation and then I will be here for questions afterwards. Um, can you type for me for a second? Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Stephanie Stevens, and I'm a planner with the City of Wheat Ridge Community Development Department. I'm presenting case number ZOA-2003, which is a code amendment related to the form and timing of cash and loop payment for parkland dedication requirements. Having implemented the parkland dedication requirements for over five years now, Staff has reviewed the fee structure and procedure and is recommending minor updates related to form and timing of cash and loop payment. I would like to enter into the public record, the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the comprehensive plan, and this digital presentation. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met, and therefore, the Planning Commission has jurisdiction to hear this case. So noted. In 2014, City Council adopted an ordinance of supporting resolution, which revised the city's subdivision regulations to set forth consistent and defensible parkland dedication requirements and to establish fees and loop. The intent of the subdivision code rewrite in 2014 was in large part to align the city code with the reality that Wheat Ridge is a largely built out community focused on redevelopment and infill projects. The subdivision regulations are intended to be streamlined, well-organized, predictable, consistent, and equitable. In doing the research that resulted in the ordinance and resolution that were adopted in 2014, one area of focus was on staff's approach to determining parkland dedications and associated fees in lieu, as well as the form and timing of payment. Most often, a fee is paid in lieu of land dedication, rather than the physical dedication of a park on site. The process has been working well and is reasonable and predictable. However, the timing of fee payment for new subdivisions does not always align with the time of construction and has been somewhat difficult to track. For example, if the fee is paid at plat recording, then they come in for a building permit. We have to check the subdivision records to make sure the fees are paid. Sometimes there's a major time lapse between the two. Subdivisions are oftentimes established far before development occurs, and these may not be reflective of the current market at time of development. In addition, requiring payment in the form of a certified check is found to be outdated practice. The slide shown on the screen shows the current language found in City Code Section 26414A4E, and it currently reads as follows. Form and timing of cash and loop payment. Cash and new payments shall be paid to the city by certified check and deposited in the city account to be used solely for the acquisition, development, or improvement of parks, open space, bicycle and pedestrian trails, and related facilities. For subdivisions, payment shall be made at time the plat is recorded. For development, payment shall be made prior to the building permit issuance. This slide shows the proposed language recommended by staff and illustrates proposed changes with text striped to be removed and added text in bold. Section 26414A4E of City Code will be edited to read as follows. Form and timing of cash and loop payment. Cash and loop payments shall be paid to the city and deposited in the city account to be used solely for the acquisition, development, or improvement of parks, open space, bicycle and pedestrian trails and related facilities. For development and subdivisions, payment shall be made prior to building permit issuance. As indicated prior, staff has found that subdivisions are oftentimes established far before development occurs. It's better correlated at time of building permit. 
Thus, staff is recommending approval to amend the subdivision regulations to require cash in lieu payment to be made prior to building for all development, including new property. In addition, the code currently requires that cash in lieu payment for park fees in the form of certified check, which creates an unnecessary step for applicants and does not always reflect current practice. This is not a code requirement for any other fee in the Community Development Department. Because park fees will now likely be paid in much smaller increments and with building permit fees, because building permit fees are not paid by certified check, this code amendment removes the requirement for the form of certified check. Staff has the ability to use discretion and require certified check for substantial fees, without this being a codified requirement. Before the hearing, the case was published in the newspaper and this presentation was also made available to view on the Wheat Ridge Speaks website. No public comments were received in person, by phone, by email, or on Wheat Ridge Speaks. In terms of process, these issues pertaining to parkland fees were presented to City Council at a study session on June 1, 2020, at which time Council gave staff direction to proceed with the Code Amendment. The Planning Commission's recommendation of the July 2nd hearing will be forwarded to City Council. This ordinance is scheduled for a public hearing at City Council on July 27th. Staff is recommending approval of the ordinance. So that concludes my presentation tonight. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and just a reminder that whatever is voted on tonight is a recommendation to City Council and City Council is the final, final decision maker on this one. Thank you. Commissioner Kirchhofer. Um, yeah, I do have, I think a couple of questions. I'm wondering, so the way the code reads that payment shall be made prior to building permit issuance. Has that been understood to mean that the payment is a condition of issuing the building permit? That's exactly correct. So that language, it sounds a little legal-ish, but it basically does require that the payment be made before we can actually issue the building permit. So no building permits until the fee payment. Um, and then my second question has to do with um, so I'm just assuming that the reason that there was a condition of it being paid by certified check in the first place was to ensure that the funds were, were certified funds or sort of guaranteed funds at the time of payment. Is there any concern about removing sort of any restriction on the, on the method of payment? No, so right now, that's a great question. Um, right now we can, even if we take this out of the code, we can still require it on substantial projects. But seeing that the code would, if this was forward, the code would be revised to require everything at building permit and plan review fees, anything, any other fees that are due with building permit do not require certified check. So it just becomes this extra step that's not necessary, but for substantial, um, it, for substantial costs, we would definitely still require it. It just wouldn't have to be in the code. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Simbai. No questions. Commissioner Disney. No questions. Commissioner Larson. You're muted, Commissioner Larson. Do you want me to unmute you? Uh, sorry. One question uh, on that, the next to last paragraph in addition to the code currently requires. There is a sentence in there that says, because park fees will now likely be paid in much smaller increments with building, per why would they be smaller increments? That's a good question. So at subdivision plat, it would require any lots in that subdivision um, to pay, to get parkland fees at the time of plat. So if it was a subdivision of 20 lots, then all 20 lots would have to pay the fee. But with building permit, you're likely gonna be seeing them come in one at a time for each building. So the fees are gonna be substantially lower. So, so there, it's sort of pay as you go, come in for a permit on one building, you pay for that one. And then six months later, you come in for another permit on a different building and you pay at that time. Do I that's understand that exactly. correctly? Okay. Yes, that's exactly correct. Um, and the, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Leo. Stephanie, can I add uh, something to that actually? Yeah, go ahead. 
Um, I would say also for, for multifamily buildings where there's just one building permit for the entire project, there's many units in a multifamily building, they would still be required to pay all of those fees at the same time. Yeah, and sorry, what I was going to say before is that if they do pay a building permit for each of those units, if five of them happen 20 years from now, they'll have to meet the current standard for what the fee is for parkland fees. So that's the advantage of going that route. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry, could, could you explain that again? Uh, the parkland fee would change from the time it's platted to when it's permitted? Potentially, we update our fees every once in a while. Um, we haven't done it since 2014, but we're starting to look into doing that again. So just trying to keep up with the current market rate for, because it's based on the sales price of land, the market value, as well as population density. So those things can become outdated if we don't do minor updates on them every once in a while. So yes, the fee could go up or down, more reflective of what the current market rate is. And, and who, who determines what the fee is? The city council adopts that fee by resolution. Thank you. Yep. Commissioner Leo? Nothing. Commissioner Antol? Nothing? Okay. Um, so on that, what you, what you just said uh, about the fee, you know, pays ago, um, do, does there need to be anything in writing that says, uh, you know, current rate, whatever the current rate of that fee is? It, or we do, we do have that all in writing. It's actually in our land use application fee schedule. Okay. So it's very clear to applicants what that fee is right up front. Um, typically, it's around just under the 2500 per unit is kind of the highest on the scale of what it can be. Uh, but it's made clear in our fee schedule as well as the resolution is available online as well. Okay. I have no further questions. Does any uh, commissioner have any other questions? Okay. Uh, I will now open up the public comment. Is there anyone that wishes to comment on this case? You will have a maximum of three minutes to speak. Speakers may not donate their time. Um, when I recognize you, please give us your name, spell your last name, and share your address. We will now unmute all participants. Please keep background noise to a minimum. If you do not plan to speak at this time, you may mute yourself through your own device. Is there anyone with the last name A through E? Is there anyone with the last name F through J? Is there anyone with the last name K through O? Is there anyone with the last name P through T? Is there anyone with the last name U through Z? Is there anyone else in the public who would like to speak? Please speak now before I close the citizens forum. Is there anybody else that's in the queue? No one signed up. Okay, I will close the citizens forum. Um, at this time, I would entertain a motion. I move to recommend approval of the proposed ordinance amending chapter 26 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws pertaining to the form and timing of cash in lieu payment for parkland dedication requirements. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? I think um, I'd like to say something. I think this is a, I think it's a great idea. It's definitely a little more uh, developer friendly. Uh, I don't see any adverse effects to the city. Um, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a good step. It just makes it a little bit easier to work with the city. And uh, definitely, um, you know, sometimes uh, developers trying to get the timing of their loans and having to put all this cash up front and then wait, wait, wait. Um, I think this is a good, a good move. So I'm definitely in favor of it. Okay, I will, is there any other discussion? Let's call for a vote.
motion passed seven to zero. Thank you. Is there any old business? No old business. Is there any new business? I guess the only new business is welcome Ari to the Planning Commission. It's good to have you tonight. Thank you. Happy to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah. And then as for August uh, Planning Commission hearings, we're looking at probably canceling the first one in August because it doesn't look like we'll have any cases um, and the remainder in August and September are pending. So just wait to hear from us on those. But we have one July 12th, 13th, right? 16th. Okay. 16th, yep. Thank you, whatever that Thursday is. <laughs> yes, and I will be, um, get because I am out next week, I will be getting you guys the agenda tonight or tomorrow, either way. I do have a question. Um, has anyone, I know at the last meeting we talked about, since we're doing this remotely, if the commissioners can be present um, if they are not at home. I mean, is it the same thing if we're not here, we can still log on or do you think that's a problem? Um, not sure if I'm quite understanding your question, but yes, you can log on if you're um, trying to view the other meetings other than the planning commission. No, I mean the planning commission, if I'm out of town, I can still get on just as if I were here. There's no problem with that, correct? Yeah, there's nothing that says that you have to be in Wheat Ridge. <laughs> to okay, be so, right. So, because normally we're together and we can't do this. Right. So I wanted to make sure, okay. Yep, okay. makes sense. Michelle Larson. The agenda item that was due to be discussed uh, at the second meeting in June that was canceled, wh where is that going to wind up at? That one's on the next hearing agenda, July 16th. Okay, and how many items on that July 16th agenda? I think just the one. I believe it's two. I think it is. Two? Yeah. Yeah. There's another ZOA, an, an ordinance, and then right. land use case. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on new business? And we don't have, um, there's no timeline or discussion yet about uh, us going back to City Hall anytime soon, right? Nope, not yet. Even we are still very limited in capacity at City Hall, so I think it'll be a little bit still. Are you guys doing like a 50%? We are trying to just encourage people to work from home as much as they can. We're not really monitoring the numbers so much yet because a lot of okay. people are able to still fully function at home or remotely. So it's working out okay for us. So we're, we're not having to keep an eye on the numbers too much right now. Okay. Well, have a great fourth, everybody. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. 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 Call for vote. Motion passed seven to zero. Have a great Fourth of July, everybody. Have a great Fourth, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.